ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the well. Welcome to the Well Podcast. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. So the older I get, fellas, it is, and this happened to me the other day, out of nowhere, I, I hear these quotes. I can't remember like when I was three, four, five years old a lot, but there are certain things that, that our minds hang on to. And one of them was a quote. I think I've even heard, Pastor Phil, you say this before, but it's the old school quote. Oh boy, the world's just going to hell in a handbasket. I heard that so much growing up, and I, I didn't know what it meant when I was five, I've six. Tongue and cheek, tongue and cheek. Oh yeah, yeah like yeah, right. Yeah, I, the mentality. Not that, that you did it from the stage or whatever. I just I thought I remember you 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 saying that you had heard it before was the context that I thought I remember. Well, that general, I think sometimes that that uh, really that dark cloud over the body of Christ. Eeyore, right. Right. Your woes, me. World's going to hell in a hand. Like no hope. Whatsoever. Absolutely. Yeah. And and that's that's I would the context. Never want to say that in any way that would be no, taken seriously. Not putting words in your mouth either. Yeah. I'm saying that when I heard it, that was the context that I heard it from. And later on in life, obviously, of of becoming a believer and understanding it, we know that there's going to be darkness in the world, but you know the Jesus is overcome, and so I just think that it's important for us to understand that uh, this. To, well, this to me is one of the most important series that we'll ever do at this church, Be, and it's based on obviously the truth of God, what He wants us to know, that we're not fooling ourselves. I I can't even wait for next week's because I got a little bit ahead of what what you're going to be talking about next week as well. But we're doing the five part series, hope for us, and um, it, interesting. I. I'm a history guy like you are a little bit, and the fact that you went to Plymouth, Mass, uh, to the National Monument of Our Forefathers, uh, it was a really cool video that you did yesterday and talking about that, and then the, just the five things that were on that monument and what they stand for. Mm -hmm. And today we're going to be talking about faith, but so timely, so necessary, and uh, it was just a, a great message yesterday and very challenging. Uh, very hopeful, but uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for tackling this difficult subject. Yeah, man, and uh, you know I, I love Kansas City, and this has been my favorite city to live in. And I always like to say, you know, go Royals. You know, let's Come kind of shout them out. Let's Come go. On. And um, I always I always love to say about Kansas City that uh, it is a slow big city, and so uh, we've got a lot of the perks of a big city, but not a lot of the traffic of Dallas or Houston or some of those cities that I'm a little more acquainted with. But man, the first time I went to Boston. There is something special about that city. And I don't know if it's because, uh, you know, when you were there, uh, you you have a sense of the history of, of our nation and, and so many things, so many decisions were made in those streets, in that area. Um, and, and it just seems like they've done a really good job in Boston of keeping a lot of that yeah, stuff. Yeah, preserving their history. Uh, I actually shot that promo video, kind of part of the bumper from the very side of the Boston Massacre standing right in front of what was uh, the governor's mansion at the time. From that balcony, they actually read the Declaration of Independence. And the Bostonians cheered as uh, they heard the Declaration of uh, Independence for the new nation, right? From there, you can do what's called the Liberty Trail. Uh, and it's a guided tour if you want one. Take right. you to the various spots where very historic events happen. Some of the homes of our founding fathers are still there. The church they worshipped in. Paul Revere's house is still yeah, it's there. Just, it's really awesome for, for those that love history first. And then, I mean, American history. Uh, and it's really important. Like most people don't have any idea today about right. our history as a nation. This is why, you know, your view of the past deeply shapes your view of the present which is why I'm convinced there's been a really, really intentional uh, work done in the last generation to really reinterpret the past, uh, to define the present. And as I said Sunday, and I tried to touch on this, when it comes to history, there can be multiple narratives. Like we live in the age of, of ideological idolatry that says, well, if any part of a narrative is true, it's all true. Or if any part of a narrative is not true, then none of it's true. That's just not true when right. it comes to history. And this is why I've tried to articulate this idea that we're either the 1619 America or we're the 1620 right. America. It's yeah. either the America 
born out of racism or the America born out of religion. Yeah, Jamestown or Plymouth yeah, Rock, right. Sure, the, yeah. these two Americas have always existed. Now, for us people of faith, as we are, what ought to concern us the most is hanging on to that, that biblical origin of our forefathers and their vision of this free civilization, unlike any other in American history. The great experiment is what they called it. Uh, could a free people stay free, or would they abuse their freedom, handle it irresponsibly, and usher back in some state of captivity? Now, before we get um, too, too much further down the road, I, I have a little bit of a, a unique thing that I got to do in Boston that I'll share real quick, because it'll bring a little bit of levity, because I, I can already feel, especially after the message yesterday, that we, we need to get down to business. It's and heavy. we need to talk about some of these things. Yeah. So let's just kind of bring a little levity. One thing that most people don't know that you can do in Boston that I did is that they have a high-flying trapeze school right off the Freedom Trail that you can you can take lessons. You can do acrobatic. You didn't do that. I did high-flying trapeze wow. in Boston right off of the the main like area it was it was huh. so fun and uh and that's the levity that I brought to this situation so uh to get us back to the serious note man you got into Romans chapter 1 Romans 8, 1 18 through 25 um such a, an important passage of scripture uh, that I think a lot of people uh speaking of founding fathers they're, they're trying to Thomas Jefferson the bible uh, who was um, a man that was a deist, not a not a devout Christian by any means. But he and, wasn't an atheist either. Correct. Which you hear a lot. Well, our founding fathers were atheists. No, they weren't. No, uh -uh. He very much believed in a God. And Jefferson respected uh, biblical values, but he just had a hard time with uh, some of the miracles. And so he was known to have actually cut out parts of the Bible that mm. were uh, incongruent with what he perceived uh, was scientific. And, uh, and so a lot of people in our culture would like to Thomas Jefferson this passage out of the Bible. What I mean by that is they would like to cut it out of the Bible, but such an important passage because it confronts a lot of the things, as we saw yesterday, that, uh, that really need to be confronted. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that I've seen in society is that we, we are, um, it, it was interesting to me, I read a book by a, um, a British uh, theologian who's really well known, and he uh, talks about his observation of American society that we are either or. We we create the we like we thrive on dichotomies. You know, you're either you're either a Royals fan or a Yankees fan. You know, you can't be both. You know, and you're either this or that. I don't know that you can be. Both. <laughs> can you do that? I, it, exactly. It's, it, I point. think it's exactly. physically, if mentally, you're a Kansas City kid, emotionally that impossible. remembers the 1970s and Freddie Patek <laughs> sitting mm -hmm. in the dugout There's yeah. some after you the can't. 1977 playoffs that ended in complete. Sadness, man. No, you can't be a Yankee. That's the third. Uh, ask the third baseman of both yeah. of those teams in that area you're talking about. Ask the two third basemen. I'm an '85 model, so I have even no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. So. <laughs> but anyway, we we just have this tendency, that, man. You know, you better be this or that. You can't. You know, it can't be both. And man, you did such a great job of helping us uh, think differently. But as I was hearing you yesterday, I was thinking, man. It, this is going to be a really hard thing for us to think through critically what you're saying because we're so uh, accustomed and so natural to fall into, man, it's either got to be a, a greedy America or a godly America. Uh, but um, what you said yesterday so well it, is it, it is both and that there are competing narratives and you're trying to help point our attention to uh, the foundation, and you, liked, you talked about Lady Faith um, yesterday and, and really point us to the foundation. Yeah, when it comes to things. matters of theology or morality, there generally are not two narratives, both of which are true. The Bible gives us clarity in matters of theology, in matters of morality. When it comes to history, uh, there can be two narratives, part of which is true here, part of which is right. true here, the part of which is untrue, part of which over here not true. And that's just being honest, really pursuing an understanding of our history in a way that is intellectually honest, as opposed to, as I've said, the the ideological idolatry of the day that says it's either this or it's this. It cannot be both, right? Uh, and I think that's really important. We recognize that as we as we look to the past to try to define the future. You know, where do we go from here as a civilization and the body of Christ? Look, the number one call of the church is not to impact the culture; it is to advance the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Yep. Seek you first the kingdom of God.
And this is where I think the church went wrong generations ago. We thought we could impact the culture without advancing his kingdom. So consequently, we didn't either. We failed to impact the culture, and we haven't advanced the kingdom. Uh, so the number one thing we can do is remember who we are, what we're called to do. Uh, and that is advance the kingdom. And in so doing, we will Amen. impact American culture again. Mm-hmm. Les, I don't know about you yesterday, but um, I'm just feeling like a heaviness uh, from Pastor Phil um, yesterday, rightfully so. I mean, we're, we're talking about really issues of life and death here. Yeah. And um, and there were a couple of things, feeling a heaviness, also feeling an appreciation uh, that we would be a church. I mean, we just came out of the book of Hebrews, and we're called to be a people who do, do not shrink back. Right. And uh, But a people of faith and a people who do courageous things. And, um, and you know, you're either doing courageous things or you're not. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of um, uh, criticism. There's going to be a lot of opinions floating around even this series, uh, but really grateful uh, that you would step in uh, the gap and that you would begin to, um, you know, every sermon you have a little bit of pastor, a little bit of priest, um, and a little bit of prophet. And I just appreciate you putting on the hat of the prophet, so to speak. And what I mean by that is that you're, uh, diagnosing the culture, understanding the Word of God, and then allowing a passage like Romans 1, 18 through 25 to speak into the culture. I appreciate the passion part of that too, the fourth P, because you are passionate about what you believe and what you believe is the truth. And so I just also appreciate that too, because that, that brings a lot of emotion out of people and helps us understand the importance of, of what we're reading, what we're talking about. What grips the heart of God ought to grip our heart. Amen. What breaks the heart of God ought to break our heart. Amen. Amen. Um, and the heart of our God is passionate when it comes to the unborn, for example. The heart of our God is passionate when it comes to idolatry of our day. Um, and so, man, I, I am very passionate about it. And you're right. The, the uh, Jefferson approach is exactly what is going on today among many pastors and theologians, what I've called many times the cut and paste theology. Romans 1 is hated, not only by those outside the church, outside of Christ, but by many people who claim to be in Christ. Right. It would, it's understandable if you're outside of Christ. Sure it yeah. is. But I, I, and I, I just have a hard time registering. How, how do you say that Jesus has saved you, but then you, you, you deny his word? I just I don't know how you reconcile that. Well, that's that's the first point of your message yesterday is truth suppression, yeah. and that so many people fool themselves into believing that well I can do the cut and paste I can take out what I want and take what I believe and put in or just match it fold it around so, what what I believe. Social scientists coined a term postmodern thought or postmodern philosophy. Mm-hmm. A lot of people here that have no idea what it means. Simply put. Postmodern philosophy says there are no absolutes, no absolute truth, no absolutes morally, no absolutes spiritually, right? So what's happened is postmodern philosophy has somehow infiltrated and infected theology. So what pastors have done is taken this philosophy that says there really are no absolutes, and now they've married that to Christianity. So now you have a church in full-blown apostasy. As I've said many times, I'll say it throughout the series, as the church goes, so goes the nation. Politics do not shape the moral climate of a nation. The pulpits shape the moral climate of a nation. Politics don't shape the spiritual climate of a nation. It's the pulpits that shape the spiritual climate of a nation. Politics are downstream from all of that. See, what we're seeing now politically, in, um, you know, legislating um, into society, things that God abhors, like abortion. Look, it's been around for 50 years, legally speaking. Roe v. Wade ushers it in. Uh, but generations of Americans could not have fathomed the legalization of abortion. Now, it's been around for centuries. It's not something new. Uh, you go back to the colonial era. Uh, preachers of that era had something to say about abortion. We're talking you know, 200 years ago or more. So it's not like abortion is something new, but the idea that it would be legal and acceptable, it was unheard of in generations past. But why? Because we were a Judeo-Christian culture that recognizes God values life from the womb to the tomb. So how do we get here? Well, it's a Romans 1 
scenario, the only way you somehow begin to legislate uh, the murder of the unborn in the womb is the creature must supplant the creator. God is now dethroned, man is enthroned. Uh, and so um, God, who makes the truth, has been subjugated to his creatures that makes up the truth. Yeah, Voltaire is, a, a, I think, a, a French philosopher, and he mm -hmm. says that, um, you know, in the beginning, God made man in his own image, and every since, man has been trying to return the favor. Mm -hmm. And uh, and not a, not a Christian guy, but he's just making an observation about what we try to do. And it just really seems like, you know, for me, you know, I said, your heart's heavy yesterday. Um, and, and I'm, I'm matching that, you know, when I've, um, had to preach on subject matters similar, uh, it's just, you know, I'm, I, I just, I, I hate, uh, that the world is in, in a lot of the condition that it is. I mean, it burdens my heart. And then you read Romans 1, 18 through 25, and it just seems like a commentary on the collapse of a society and that the wrath of God is like, you know, I think that like how arrogant are we to think that God is not keeping receipts, you know, that he's not paying attention to what's going on. And right here where it says that, you know, in, in verse 24, um, therefore God gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. It's like the, the wrath of God is both passive and active. And so what we're seeing really in Romans 1 is that there's a, there's a, a, a way in which God works where he's going to, you know, you mess with God, he's going to have active wrath. You know, this is the the wrath of God is going to fall. There's going to be, you know, think lightning bolt from heaven type, th type thing. But then there's the passive wrath of God. And um, this is where God, you know, says, hey, if you want that so much, you can, you can have it. I think about uh, hearing stories about one of my friends that got caught smoking cigarettes when we were growing up. And uh, his dad wasn't a smoker. Uh, my dad was, you know, and so I think if, if I would have got caught smoking cigarettes, my dad would have probably lit one up with me. But in, in my friend's family, that was seen as something that you shouldn't do. And so he catches my friend. I think we were in middle school. And I'm like, man, what happened? He said, man, my dad took me out there. And he said, you want a cigarette so bad? And he made me smoke every cigarette in the mm -hmm. pack, back to back to back. And it did taught he, him a did lesson. He crawl home? Exactly, right. And, um, and so he was saying, hey, you want this so much? Well, you can have it. And you can have it in excess. And once you have it, you're going to realize, man, that is going to make you so sick. Mm -hmm. And what breaks my heart is that I, I feel like that as a society, and you referenced this even in the opening video, as a society, like we are unraveling mm -hmm. and society is unraveling and people are lunging for hope and trying to make sense of it. And so unless you started off with the world's going to hell in a handbasket, well, anytime I hear that from someone older, I say, hey, why don't you come and see what the Lord's doing amongst this next generation? Amen. Yeah. Because the next generation is seeing the 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 craziness, if you will, what's going on. And they're hungry for something new. Uh, they're hungry for something more. And so, you know, the wrath of God is is being poured out. Uh, uh, maybe it's just being let out, so to speak, his passive wrath. Uh, but I am hopeful that the Lord is turning. There's a lot here. of reason to hope. Look, and you're right. Romans one is an illustration of the judgment of God falling on a civilization, not through the lightning bolt, as you put it, but just God saying, "Okay, have it your way." Three times there are free phrases here in Romans one. God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them up. Where God eventually says, "I take my hands off of you. The hand of favor is off of you. The hand of grace is no more." Uh, you have what you want. I give you over to it. Now the natural progression, the natural fruition of sin, now the consequences of that sin will be your judgment upon you. We're, mm. we're watching that happen now. Again, guys, I make this observation all the time. The social science doesn't lie. The statistics tell the truth. And anybody paying attention has to ask what's changed. Highest levels ever in the history of our nation, addiction, depression, anxiety, suicide. The diagnostics say we're not healthy. We're yeah. not becoming more evolved. We are devolving, not evolving. We're not becoming more mm -hmm. enlightened. Uh, the diagnostic is darkness. People are falling into darkness and hopelessness and despair. So, And that's the, me the message that we hear counterintuitive to that. Just turn on your TV. It probably doesn't matter what channel you watch. 
what the message you're going to hear, though, is we're doing great. Yeah, happy clapping. Everything's yeah. great. Mm-hmm. We, we've got everything that you need. Just listen to this or just do this, and everything is good. And it's most of it is mm-hmm. a lie. And it's like uh, you know, Lady Faith with the star on her forehead. The the imagery here is that enlightenment comes from Him. She's pointing to the heavens. Well, we live in another age of enlightenment. Same philosophy, human reason. We can reason our way out of this scholasticism, intellectualism, we're smart enough, we can do this. Uh, and it, it, it's, 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 as you say in Romans 1, futility. The futility and the foolishness of the human heart to say we can do this apart from God. Right. The, the modern-day lady faith, if there was a statue made today, she wouldn't be pointing up, she would be pointing right sure. here. Mm-hmm. Hey, just believe in yourself. That's right. Yeah. You have what it takes. But one of the most annoying phrases I hear in people talking about books, I'm just going to throw this out there, self-help books. Oh, self-help. Uh, oh, you know what? You just need to, get, you need to get centered. You need to help sure. yourself. And sure. I, need to re- I can't respond right away because if I respond right away, it's going to be a reaction <laughs> instead of a response. I'm going to reel that back in. Lord, give me the words. Find Good yourself. Be true to yourself. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. If yeah. I were true to myself. Let me just throw I this I wouldn't up still there. be married There's after your... 33 years. Yeah. Let's start there. Right. If I were true to myself, uh, I wouldn't still be married after 33 years. I'd be divorced. Don't know how many times because I would not have been faithful to one woman mm-hmm. if I was true to myself. Right. If I was true to myself, I would have been hooked on pornography and captivity many years ago. If I was true to myself, I would have been an alcoholic. 21 years of age, I was being true to myself. Sure. I was living my best life. I denied myself nothing in those years as a young adult. I was on a pathway of self-destruction when God sent an 18-wheeler to intercept my life. Right. And that day, I lost myself. I didn't find myself. Amen. And and in losing myself, I, I found a different self. I found Christ in me. That was hope for me. That's hope for us. And that's what people need to recognize. You want to be true to yourself? Uh, it's going to end in destruction eventually. Right. But if it don't be true to yourself, be true to God. Yeah. But again, that's, that's like such a counterintuitive narrative because we have like, I think it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs mm-hmm. that's been so ingrained in our education system and just our thinking, which, you know, it's leading us to self-actualization. And it just so happens to be that, the path to self-actualization is typically the path to self-destruction. <laughs> yeah, you no, know, because you're you're living for yourself. Same and, highway, uh, different. And exit. it's so hard. It's so you know. I think that's why the the teachings of Jesus are so radical. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, again, I think that we've lived enough uh, in the close of self-actualization and Maslow's hierarchy of needs that we've realized that it's maybe we've gotten it wrong. <laughs> you know, again, the results are in. Can you look at the studies? And I think the the canvas is primed for a, a Jesus revolution. Yeah. yeah, and this is the good news, and you kind of alluded to it already, Chad. Look, there's a generation that at least we can see from observation. For all you hear about the Gen Zs abandoning God, abandoning you know the worldview, the faith, or whatever, listen, a lot of these 20-somethings are coming back to the faith. Uh, their parents are the ones that had abandoned the faith. Right, mm-hmm. These kids are being raised in chaotic, crazy homes, uh, in a faithless home that didn't know anything about it, and they're finding Jesus, man. They're at paradigm. Praise God. And uh, they are are actually more mature than a lot of their moms and dads, Hmm. have more sense about them than a lot of their moms and dads. We run into that in Fusion, too. Yeah. We're not talking about a one-off here. We're talking, I mean, hundreds. Mm Mm-hmm. Just on a Tuesday night. Yeah. Um, Pastor Phil, you wrapped up yesterday's message with uh, verse 25. It just says, you know, that we have exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped the ser- and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And uh, one of the things that, um, you know, again, <laughs> uh, I felt for you yesterday, man, you, you've you been out of the pocket for three weeks. You come back kicking off a new series that is fully loaded. And, uh, and I'm like, you know this uh, this guy needs he needs he needs about 45 more minutes at least you yeah. know and yeah. and so um 
mean, you did a great job of handling this text and and then aiming it at you know the things that you you did yesterday. But even you know one of the things I think about a lot on verse twenty five is that we we are all by nature glory glory thieves, and we have a, a proclivity, a tendency towards. Uh, idolatry, and mm-hmm. you, you hit on this self idolatry, but it's idolatry of, of many things. And um, one of the things that if somebody's listening to this and uh, or watching this, man, I would just ask them, where are you doing that? You know, I, I think that there's a tendency, and and we've we we've, we've talked about this a couple weeks ago uh, when we hear the voice of the Lord. There's a tendency to be like, man, I wish such and such was here, and we could miss even what God's trying to speak to us. And so this is one of those messages, and this is one of those series where it can really be weaponized in the in the heart of the believer to demonize the the hearts of the unbelievers. Uh, but you finished yesterday by drawing us and calling us to get on our knees, and um, and I think it's so important that we really allow the Word of God to read us first, and to think about where are we suppressing the truth, uh, where are we uh, you know trying to take God's role, and where are we elevating ourselves, and where are we doing what verse 25 says, where are we exchanging the truth of God for the lie and worshiping other things? Yeah, we all have reason for repentance. Yeah. Look, uh, it might be a good, maybe a good exercise this week. Anybody listening, go read Nehemiah chapter one. Nehemiah is broken for the condition of his people. Nehemiah is broken for the condition of uh, the Jewish nation. And he never says, God, forgive them of their sins. Though he personally had committed none of their sins, he's not the reason they were in captivity. He's not the reason they were still in Persia instead of Jerusalem. Yet he says, forgive us our sins. Look, I've never committed an abortion, but it's happened on my watch. That's right. Uh, I've I've never committed a lot of sins that have come to really mark our civilization but it's happened on my watch. Mm -hmm. It's happened on our watch. Listen, as the church goes, so goes the nation. We need to repent that we have failed in some way, all of us collectively, of being the salt of society, the preservative, the stands in the way of the decay. And that's why we ought to repent. All of us need to repent of being, I think, mesmerized by the trivial, distracted by the temporal. We've given our heart to so many other things. Sure. You know, idolatry doesn't have to be, I'm hooked on alcohol. Right. Or I'm, or I'm worshiping some statue or, or yeah, something. Mm-hmm. Right. Idolatry can be, man, we we are just satisfied uh, with the things of this world so that, honestly, we have no appetite left for the things of God. Yeah. And that's certainly true of my life, Chad. Sure. Yeah. Uh, that, I mean, every time I read this passage, it, it is so convicting. Because, again, you know, I think that it's a defense mechanism to uh, to try to squirm out from underneath the guilt or the conviction, rather, that the Holy Spirit gives by trying to think about someone else that needs to hear this more. But, man, it is it is so good and so healthy for us to say, God, uh, you know, I, I am your son, and I know you want to speak to me. And so would you please? And then and allow yeah. me to orient my heart in the right place so that I can be focused on the battle that is at ha- uh, that is at hand, and also so I can uh, serve those that disagree, that that are blind spiritually, and and uh, and have the courage to do that and the compassion to do that. I need to have, and I do have Romans twelve two on my mirror. Uh, I need to I need to have this in my mind all the time. You know, if if, if culture is affecting me and I feel my mind and heart slipping that way, I'm being conformed. But if I'm in the Word and letting the Word of God, letting Jesus Himself take care of every part of me, then I'm being transformed. You know, the the verse, no, don't be conformed any longer to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that mind can only get transformed by being in God's Word Amen. and knowing what He wants for us and and living that consistent life. I was, I was telling, talking to some guys the other day, you know, if I, I've been married to my wife almost 29 years now. Let's go. And how good we might still be married. But how good would that be if I only saw her, talked to her, spent time with her one to two days a week if in 29 years? I'd still be married no, your wife legally. Less, that'd be your loss. That'd be, it'd be my yeah. loss. Yeah. It, would, it, it, would be, it would be a bad marriage. But it would be, be the be most lopsided, loss. dumbest loss in right. the history of losses. Absolutely. Uh, my wife is a joyful in the Lord daily human being. But, you know, the point is, is that that's what God calls us to do. And culture is just, there's so much sinful arrogance 
in in our world, but in our country right now. Um, I, I can't believe you know we we talked about you talked about abortion in your sermon, and that's just one of of, of so many things that we see. But I'm still amazed that at this stage. I'm amazed that I'm not because I know Satan's always trying to do what he's trying to do, but I'm amazed that as a nation, that's where we're at because we weren't there 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 100 years ago, and now it's, it, there's just this constant fight and that it's – people are saying that it's not murder and and that it's it's okay to do it and, and there's arguments going on of, well, if you do it at this time but not at this time and I, I – my head wants to explode right. in all of this. And so I'm just, and I'll let you go from here, but I just want people to understand the truth. And, and what you said, the truth sounds like hate to those who hate the truth. Yeah. What a profound sentence sure. that was. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, the, the reason why that we're eventually going to get to yet another allegorical figure at the National Monument to the Forefathers, mm-hmm. her name is Education. Yeah. And what you learn from this figure and these four figures around Lady Faith, they're basically table legs of society. They're the table legs that hold up a civilization. Education is one of them. And what we learn from education, this is a young mother taking personal responsibility for the education of her children. Mm-hmm. And you see her father, an older gentleman, also at her side. What she's saying is it's the responsibility of every generation to reach the next generation to teach the next generation from the previous generation, grandma and grandpa to the present generation, mom and dad teaching those little ones. So what's happened? Look, you go from the world war II generation, which was 65% Christian worldview to the boomer generation, 35% Christian worldview to my generation, generation X, 16% Christian worldview to the millennial generation, my children's generation, 4% Christian worldview. What's happened? Mm. What's happened is one generation failed to reach the next. The church failed to be what he's called us to be, and that is to uh, pass the torch of faith, lady faith. We have failed to pass the mantle of faith. So this is what we have to get back to. Amen. Now, here's the deal. In all the bad news, there's good news. Sure. Yeah. You see this generation, there's something happening in the generation. There is, yeah. The, the youngest among us. It's exciting. It yeah, is. It, it really is. It should, it should encourage all of us. The world's not going to hell in a handbasket. Right. right. And, <laughs> and what's really unique, Pastor Phil, that, that we're getting to see this happen in our church, it, and this is a really unique thing uh, at our church where we're seeing that young generation come. Uh, you know, I mean, h- hundreds, yeah. you know, like like borderline a thousand. There's reason for lives. optimism. It's crazy. Yeah. Listen, there's optimism. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a new generation of kingdom leaders and preachers and pastors and missionaries emerging. The yes. youngest generation in some ways is leading the elder generation. That's right. That's right. Uh, and uh, so grateful to see that. People need to be encouraged by that. Mm-hmm. Hey, I want to ask you a question. Um, just in, I don't know who all got to listen to the sermon yesterday, but... Uh, you wrapped up um, really by giving us some some practical handles uh, on what we should do in light of uh, what God's Word teaches and in light of the cultural landscape that we're facing today. Would you kind of run back to some of that? And, you know, uh, the question I could ask it this way, what is what does yesterday's message mean to you? Or in light of yesterday's message, what are you asking me to do? And again, you answered those very clearly yesterday, but I think even, you know, uh, I don't know when somebody's going to listen to this or watch this and if they, you know, were there yesterday or not. Um, but would you answer that question? Uh, what, what do I need to do in light of, of the message? Yeah. Well, um, specifically, as we shared yesterday, if you're in the state of Missouri, Amendment 3 is a ballot initiative that will be voted on by Missouri voters in November that would permanently enshrine abortion with other implications, into the Missouri Constitution, forever enshrining abortion as a right in the state of Missouri. We articulated yesterday, this is, you know, abortion is an abomination before God. It is straight out of the pit of hell. It's Satan's attempt to destroy what God loves, the image Mm -hmm. of God that is is within the womb. That's right. Right? So, um, 
you know, a lot of people listening aren't part of the state of Missouri. We have listeners, especially in Kansas with uh, the Johnson County campus now and the church house movement that's all over our country. But the reality and is— And we have people listening all over the world sure to the well. Yes, yeah, here, pretty yeah, cool. The, here's the point. The abortion is, is a divide and a debate nationwide really throughout all of Western civilization. So regardless of where you find yourself, you need to know what does the Bible say about this? Mm -hmm. First point yesterday, truth suppression. People will distort the truth. God's very clear about the truth. He's not trying to hide the truth. He's trying to reveal the truth. Life in the womb is sacred to God. It should be to us too. If you're in the state of Missouri, vote no on Amendment 3. Uh, For all of us, we need to hit our knees. Uh, Ezekiel twenty two thirty. I sought for a man or a woman among them that would stand in the gap and make up a wall before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. That came from Ezekiel that was doing an autopsy looking back from Babylon as to what happened to his nation, why it died and finally declined and went into complete decay. And God says through the prophet, I sought for a man among them that would stand in the gap, and I found no one. That's when the gavel finally fell. And the judgment of God, guys, it doesn't fall in a day. It happens over the course of generations. It's gradual. It's subtle. Uh, for the Jews, it took 200 years for the gavel to finally fall. The Babylonians finally came and led them all away. 200 years in the making. God over and over again sending them a prophet saying, repent, repent. Turn from your idols. Come back to me. Uh, but Romans 1.18 is a universal truth. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Meaning, when a society or an individual repeatedly resists the gracious offer of God for salvation, resists the truth of God. Listen, if you're not walking in the truth of God, you're not walking in the grace of God, all that's left is the judgment of God. Mm-hmm. So... Um, I'm convinced the hope, the hope is in the God of heaven, but the hope is in us. Colossians 1.27, hope in us, the hope of glory, Christ in us. See, Christ lives in us, which means the hope is also within us because Christ is in us. Amen. What does that yeah. mean? It means when the body of Christ, spirit-filled, sold out, fully surrendered, followers of Jesus Christ, stand together locked heart and heart, arm in arm, in prayer, it moves the heart of God. It stays the judgment of God. I'm convinced of that. Something that you shared um, yesterday as well that was so good, just another practical note, um, grab a yard sign. You know, put a yard sign. We, we're in an area, again, I don't know who's watching this, listening to this, where you're from, but if you're from this area, grab a yard sign. And uh, you even tethered some practical advice. If you have a neighbor that you know disagrees with you politically on this issue, go have a conversation with them and and open up the dialogue. But how amazing would it be if we mobilized a tsunami of people that would, would um, as you said, uh, they would pray, uh, they would hit their knees, uh, that they would they would put a yard sign in their in their yard and really impact the momentum towards you know voting no on this amendment three, and then they would register to vote yeah. and they would mm-hmm. they would hit the ballots and they can't would, vote if you're not registered. Exactly. There's, a, there's a lot of people out there that don't know what they believe about this. Mm-hmm. These are the people that can be moved by a conversation with a neighbor, for example, mm-hmm. or a whole city block of yard signs that all say vote no on three. The reality is human beings are, um, are herd animals. It's group think. A lot of people don't think for themselves. This is why yard signs work. A single yard sign, maybe not. But hundreds of yard signs, all of a sudden somebody thinks, you know what? There's a lot of people against this. Maybe I should be too. Mm-hmm. That's why it's powerful. That's why we're passing out thousands of these vote no signs. And uh, the good news is I'm seeing thousands of these vote no signs. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that is good. Um, let me add, too, that it's important for us, and I talk with my wife about this all the time, and especially my sons, that when there's people that you know that maybe believe something different or or they are lost or they don't believe in God's truth, you know, I, I wrote this note, hatred does not equal Jesus. It's not the same thing. And so we need to speak the truth in love. You're not going to convince your enemies 
of anything. And so it's important to have those conversations, those gentle conversations like, hey, tell me why you believe. I think you'd mentioned this too. Tell me why you believe that. Tell me why you're going to vote maybe yes if you if you find out or something like that, whether it's a neighbor or somebody with a different sign, but strike up a gentle, calm conversation and just get to know them a little bit instead of, oh, well, I, I'm, I'm here now because right. I see that you have a different yard sign than me. You're voting yes. Instead and of beating them with your yard be, sign. Be, right? Well, those yard signs aren't heavy. It's, it's trench warfare <laughs> yeah. in America today. It is. Two sides, dig your trench, we're dug in, they're dug in, and nobody's going to win. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is required is somebody has the courage to get out of their trench, right. walk across the yard, have a real conversation. Mm-hmm. And here's the win, guys. Look, the win is never to convince somebody else of your side by you doing all the talking. Mm-hmm. If you're doing all the talking, uh, it's not a win. Yeah. No. Get them talking. You do most of the listening. So tell me how tell me how you arrived at that decision. Tell me your story. Mm-hmm. Tell me your story that brought you to that conclusion. I can't tell you the bridge that you will build with someone then to be heard. You've out earned the right to be heard. Now now you've earned the right. They will listen. Mm-hmm. That's how you have that conversation, man. That's what we need at such a time as this. That's good. Absolutely. Well, uh, before we close, I want to remind people just in case, you know, we mentioned listeners, not everybody watches, but a lot of people do. And if w- this particular topic and this series, Hope for Us, we could have, it could almost last as long as our Hebrews <laughs> segments did. It's or, not, uh, I promise it won't. It yeah. won't, but it's it could. It could. Yes, yeah, just five <laughs> weeks, but it could be 50. But regardless of that, I, I want to just want to encourage people, if you haven't seen yesterday's sermon, go back online and and watch it and and make it comparable to this and and take them both together if you're able to do that as you download or as you spend time watching. So uh, it's really important. You don't want to miss anything on either side of it. So I, I highly recommend that our listeners and viewers just make sure you you check it out. Go back. Just because it's not Sunday anymore doesn't mean you can't go back and do it. And That's right. If you're technically challenged, like maybe I am, you, find a kid. They'll help you. The next generation, the next two generations behind you, they'll help you. Uh, as well. So, Chad, will you uh, pray us out here, man? Yeah, I would love that. Lord, we love you. And God, we just thank you that you are seated on your throne and that nothing catches you by surprise. Uh, But God, I just, uh, I know if my heart hurts, I can only imagine how much yours does. And Father, I just uh, personally apologize for where I have um, Mm -hmm. suppressed the truth in my own life. And I personally apologize where I have exchanged the truth uh, that you have made so plainly known uh, that I've exchanged that for a lie, and I've I've worshipped created things, myself, uh, sports, fun things. I've worshipped those things over the Creator God, and I just say I'm sorry for that. God, I do repent for our for our country for the way that we have mishandled and we have abused and we have murdered the blood of the innocent. God, and I, I just pray that you would break the people in our country and that you'd help us to see what's going on. And God, I pray you'd help us to no longer turn a blind eye, help us to do what we can do. Uh, and God, I pray that you'd help us to save people. And God, I pray that you would also help us to be committed beyond the womb uh, to people. And God, you help us to be those that uh, seek to put the love of God on display in a tangible way. God, I pray for this, this episode that it would go f- uh, far and that it would impact people and inspire them uh, to stand, to stand strong for the things that you call us to in a way that would bring you much glory. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you for stopping by the Well Podcast. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. If you found this podcast helpful in any kind of way, be sure to share it with your friends. For any other information, please visit livingproof.co. And we pray that you would have a blessed day.